And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. This is, well, first off, let me introduce you to the man in the shadows, the shadow man. You are shadow man today. You are I Lou am. Sander. Welcome. Welcome to Thursday. Thank I you very like... much. It's a pleasure to, to see Thursday. Isn't it? Well, it is. Always... Well, the, the alternative... <laughs> <laughs> to not see Thursday is well, it's it's darker than where you're at right now. It's yeah, it's pretty be, because because who wants to be stuck in Wednesday for eternity? What what? Oh no, never mind. I was thinking uh, Groundhog Day. That was a Saturday, wasn't it? Bill Murray I don't movie know. was that a Saturday? What day was that? Whatever day really that sure. was, I went it was that on day. Groundhog Day. Actually, I would love to experience Groundhog Day like that. Yeah, day in and day out. He became a virtuoso on the piano and other things. I'm not going to mention yeah. the other things because I'm a married man. But he had to he had to rob the uh, uh, what you call it the the armored truck all those times. Well, not really rob, just kind of let the uh, bag of money fall where it where it may and. Right. Oh yeah, know. yeah, yeah. He had to cut. But imagine if you were like a diehard. Uh, way out there and capper and you just had to go around telling everybody taxation is theft and you ah, kept winning yeah. people over and then the next day you kept having to do it again if you were an and capper like a diehard and capper you do it every or, it, or if every <laughs> day was election day oh 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 you voting yeah. Oh, every every day is election day. Are you voting today? Who are you voting for? <laughs> no, <laughs> make it stop. Oh my gosh! Every day, every day. And and on that note, folks, we're gonna play our two minute warning. This is time for you guys to grab your popcorns, your beers, whatever else you need to get yourself all fired up for this. This is the actual first ever I Wire Pulse Thursday. Featuring Lou Sander and myself, Paul Gordon. We'll see you in two minutes. That gives me time to blast out my promos. Tonight, I must not fear. Fear is the money. Wait, wait, hold on. I'm going to go back. <laughs> I, I clicked on the two-minute warning, but go ahead and say that. And then I'll go back to the two-minute warning again. Go ahead. Tonight, tonight's show is brought to you by beer. Beer. It's what and people it's drink. And the second <laughs> half will be brought to you by bourbon. Bourbon. Hey, if we get to bourbon time, that means we had a good show. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the mind killer. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear is the mind killer. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Fear is the mind killer. With paralyzing needed effort. Fear is the mind killer. To convert retreat into advance. Convert retreat into advance. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no more. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear is the mind killer. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Listening to I Wire Pulse Thursday with Lusander Fiend and Paul Gordon, featuring a shorter leash, a longer leash, and finally going off the leash. And now here are your hosts, Lusander Fiend and Paul Gordon. I oh, just got your name wrong. 
What, what should I do yeah. about that? I don't know about that. I don't know. I mean, I paid her good money to do that voiceover. And uh, actually, I paid her nothing. <laughs> <That's my laughs> wife. I paid her nothing. You guys can watch me as I adjust lose one image here, which was not right. But I, but I got it corrected. So it's Lou Sander. I don't know who this yeah. Lou Sander fiend guy is. He is somebody that has been made an unperson by by, chair, by, by, by by Premier Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mr. Zuck said no more. The fiend is dead. Yeah. Well, not the been, fiend. Lou Sander fiend is dead. Yeah. Long live yeah, Lou Sander fiend lo, well, because he's dead. Well, yeah. Long No, it's the king. The fiend is dead. Long live the Sander. <laughs> but anyway. So, so anyway, we are going to do our first segment, which is well, let's let's just set up what our show is going to be like almost every Thursday. We're going to start the show this Thursday, and then we're not having a show next Thursday because I'm going to be watching my daughter sing, play the bassoon, and play the clarinet in one night. So I can't wait for that. This show is, the segments are shorter leash, longer leash, off the leash. You want to explain what they are? Yes. If we look at, uh, if we look at the coercive enterprise, the monopoly of violence, uh, we, we find that it, it, it's, it's quite similar to a leash because um, ultimately government limits you. Now, with the shorter leash, that's when that's when things are, are clamped down upon. Uh, and, and if you look at examples like, uh, how could I put, it? Um, prohibition wouldn't be a, it, it might be an example. Prohibition of alcohol may be an example of a shorter leash. Is probably more along the lines of a choke chain. Uh, well, yeah, for some, uh, for yeah, many, yeah. Yeah. So, so the Bolshevik Revolution is definitely a shorter leash. It's a shorter leash. It's a it's a choke chain. It's a shock collar and an electric fence around the yard. And the yard is one foot by one foot. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the shorter leash is when when government takes more control over your Reels life it and back. and Reels yeah, it back. yeah, yeah, basically. So. Um, the longer leash is when people vote really hard and get a little bit more freedom and the, uh, the government kind of lets, kind of lets go a little bit. Uh, they, they kind of, um, Soviet Union being another example towards the, towards the end of the Soviet empire and, and the demise of it, they, they started to figure out that, uh, the, the, the socialist economic system, which is not really an economic system, it's more of a management system. They found out that that didn't bring the best results. So therefore they loosened some of the restrictions and they started using financial incentives to get people to do things. And they found that that worked out a little bit better. So that's, that's a bit of a longer leash. Now, th granted, they could, they could go and do that. And then they, if they start to see that the system is working a little bit too good, uh, they could have, um, they could have uh, tugged on the leash because the leash is always retractable because the leash is not freedom. The leash is, is the, the control. The leash is it's, an illusion of yeah. – it, it puts you in a comfortable place to not challenge going well, to the next place, which is – yeah. Off the leash. Oh. Absolute, pure, unadulterated, pure, uncut freedom – not tainted by any social contracts, constitutions, or any other harmful impurities. Right. Pure freedom. Pure freedom. And the thing about the longer leash, and actually we're going to have a story I think that's going to kind of illustrate the point. The thing about the longer leash is the law of unintended consequences. It's kind of like we're not going to talk about it in this show, this episode, but, you know, the net neutrality debate. Yep. Yeah, you know they're they're getting rid of regulations, but regulations exist, and there's like so. Is it is it going to be better or worse? Or you, you don't know for sure. I mean, you could make an educated guess. You guys can have arguments about that, but you don't know for sure because there's there's this this entangled mess that that's lying dormant over here. You never know if you if you if you get a longer leash over here if it leads you into a cage. <laughs> <laughs> longer leashes are not all that awesome so yeah well the thing is that the leash is retractable so they can just give it a good little tug they hit that little trigger and it, it comes in like a fishing line and 
and boom. Comes in like so, a yeah. wrecking ball. I hope I don't yeah. have to pay Miley Cyrus for that. But yeah. Ooh. <laughs> comes in like, come in like a... well, I'm not going to sing it because then I totally get sued. Let's go to our. Well, our, the Thanksgiving version is coming in like a butterball. <laughs> I'm already there. I, I'm there. <laughs> you know what? Oh, I, I didn't want to go there. I, I I came in and I was the butterball, so we're gonna begin our, our we're gonna we're gonna hit shorter leash and this is our this is our little opening for shorter leash. I hope you like it. Our course of association shortening the leash on their pets. We cover stories of the state, the government, the coercive enterprise, the coercive association, plotting to or succeeding in shortening the leash on those they presume to rule. Welcome to a shorter leash. And you are on a shorter leash, and we have our first story already. Are you ready for the first story? Let me start with a quote, and this comes from, uh, from I believe, is Voltaire. Uh, it is difficult to free fools from the leashes that they revere. Yeah. Well, they don't see it as a leash, so, yeah, it's... So the World and, War... And it, it looks like we've already freaked out our first listener today. I know. <laughs> I've never gotten a comment like that on, on doing it. It's like, uh, yeah, we freaked out our first listener, Marcelo Serrato. Marcelo, sorry. Mar you Marcelo dorks Cerati. make me unlike this page now. <laughs> that's always... That's awesome. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you for the words of encouragement. Well, Excuse I always me. shoot for a new record. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. Good, good, good show, old man. Good show. So the world war over IP heats up as the race to control IP in emerging markets it accelerates. Did I'm assuming you read this article and you did the homework and you got this all figured out because this is no, a, but I can crazy. discuss the subject. So this is Asian IP threats and opportunities high on the agenda for corporate Australia and New Zealand. So corporates from Australia and New Zealand ignore IP issues in Asia's developing countries at their own peril. Delegates to IBPC Australia, you sure heard today. Essentially what they're talking about are there, there's a race to get IP rights and get trademarks and everything in China and India, where traditionally IP hasn't been a strong part of their lives. But, you know, now they're coming into the civilized world. So now all of a sudden they're starting to enter civilized, into civilized world. So now they're starting to, uh, you know, get into the, to the IPs. So now there's this rush to buy IP rights in, China and IP rights rights in in India, especially trademark copyrights and whatnot. So you can get the best brand names and 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 do stuff with it. So there's so so there's the quote here. If you aren't filing IP in China, you're missing the boat. In fifteen years you'll have nothing to use there. That's right. So that's IPs. So so I, I'm, I'm taking in. You're a you're a fan of IP. Uh, no, I'm not. It's it's a uh, it's a horrible thing. It's it's welfare horrorism of the highest degree. It's uh, it's paying people to to not do anything. Uh, well, they did we something, having, but it's paying them now to do nothing. Yeah. Well, we were discussing it before, and you were relating a couple stories to me of uh, IP battles and, and just how horrible it is. And and ultimately, what it what it is is it, it it's not a it's not a rush to accomplish anything. It's a rush to get a trademark. It's a rush to get uh, the government to say, okay, you you own this idea here. And the thing about an idea is, ideas are infinitely replicable, and you can't possibly own an idea. But to, to make make matters even worse, if somebody comes out with an idea, and I'm not sure how far the ownership of that idea stretches, but if somebody else comes along and makes some improvements to it, so long as it falls within a certain uh, closeness of the original idea, maybe, and I, I'm not really sure, uh, the 
original people that the, the patent holders or trademark holders, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, 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 the rent seekers. Yes. Rent would, seekers. That's a good yeah. word for it. Right. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not talking about rent seeking in the good way to where you own property and you rent it out. I'm talking about the people that, uh, go to, go to government to make their, to make their living, to get their daily bread, so to speak. So if, if they do a, um, if they come up with an idea, they get the patent for it and somebody else comes along and makes an improvement on it and correct me if I'm wrong. Is there, is there a, a certain amount of, uh, improvement that, uh, that they can make to where they escape the original patent or is it, um, that the idea is always owned and, and any improvement that's made becomes the ownership of the people that didn't do anything to do the improvements. I don't, I don't think the, you don't, you don't have to, they don't own the improvement, but they still own a cut from whatever you sell based on their original idea. It's one of the reasons why, you know, Smith and Wesson got the license for, this is what they got the license for, for, drilling a hole all the way through the the cylinder of a revolver. Somebody thought of it first, sold the rights to Smith & Wesson. And so if you wanted to make these types of guns, these revolvers with the holes drilled all the way through, you'd have to pay Smith and & Wesson. And, and I, would, I would argue that, that that really slowed down as, as mercurial... Uh, as the development of guns was from like the 1860s to 18, well, really, it's still going on, really. But as 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 mercurial as it was from the 1860s to the 1880s, a lot of it was slowed down because there were all these innovators, and 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 some of them they tried, like Merwin and Holbert or whatever that Merwin and whatever it was, they they tried to innovate, but they you know, they would face lawsuits from Smith and Wesson and they couldn't go forward. So the innovation was hampered significantly. And that's what IP does. That's why I call it anti-human because it, 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 it fundamentally alters natural progression. You know, I don't know why progressives, you guys, your name is progressive, progressive as in progressing. Why would any of you ever support IP? It's anti-progressive. Because, because it's Orwellian. Just, just like, most government stuff is Orwellian in name. Uh, supporters of government are Orwellian in name. It's it's like the uh, Freedom Act. There's no freedom in there. It's it's the Taking Away Freedom Act. No, no, no. It's Every, a freedom. Uh, You're getting it wrong. You you don't understand. Freedom Act. It's not saying it's the Freedom Act. It's Freedom Act. Like acting. I was only acting. See, now you know. For, and for a daily payment of just nineteen eighty four, you can you can have all the government you want. Right. If that's not enough. Just wait. There's more. Right. Well, there's always more. That's the thing. There's <laughs> a, there's there's absolutely always more. I, IP to me is a game of who has the best lawyers. That's all it is. That's all it comes down to. The that's lawyers exactly that can, what it is. It's the lawyers who can dance the language of law. And, and as a matter of fact, there's there's some some major tech companies out there. Uh, possibly the biggest names in the business, or definitely some of the biggest names in the business. And my understanding is that they spend more on paying lawyers for RP or for IP than they spend on research and development. That would make sense. It's that's why you know if you're going to if you're going to come up with a really great product. You will spend the majority of your life defending it in court if it's a product that makes money. Mm -hmm. And, and if, it's a, if it's a product that could possibly make money and it requires some serious capital to, to get started, there's a very good chance you're not going to get the capital because the, the large corporations will just sit on it and say, dude, we're not doing anything with this until we can get it. We're going to wait till that thing expires. So that's what IP is. IP is mm -hmm. fundamentally against the development of stuff. It's like before, I think I've seen that Jeffrey Tucker give a speech about IP once, and he talked about this, and I kind of knew about it before, although when I knew about it at the time, I didn't think of it quite the same way that I do now. 
before there was IP, you notice that you have, if you look at the classical composers, you see a lot of variations on a theme. They, they liberally took from other composers. They gave them credit, but they liberally took from other composers. They took their hook, and they did new stuff with it. And it was, it was a great flourishing. It was a conversation that was going on between musicians. And that conversation hardly ever happens anymore because a musician comes up with a great hook and nobody's going to be able to do anything with it. It's like, what's the name of that ar ar arcade fire that they have some weird little hook that a whole bunch of other bands incorporated and they're, and they're considering trying to sue all these bands for using this little, little hook. It's like, I think it's called the millennial whoop or, or something like that. And so these bands, they picked up this little phrase that they came up with. And now they're literally thinking of going out and suing people. I keep a top 100 of my favorite songs. And I like this, this newish arcade fire song. And when I heard they did that, I was like, no, you're gone. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They're Good probably traumatized. You. They're out Good of PG's you. top 100. They're done. Good. Good for you. Yeah, the yeah. The, I, the thing the thing about IP is it, it is it really stops the innovation because you can't build on it. And I, I believe it's Thomas Sowell that had had this phrase. I'm probably gonna butcher it a little bit, but I'm gonna hit the gist of it. Success is must be renewed daily, but an alibi you can ride on that for the rest of your life. An alibi or an excuse, whatever. Uh, so, in a world outside of IP. Uh, producers, whether it's whether it's content producers or product producers, they have to they have to come up with new stuff on a regular basis. They have to they have to improve. They have to innovate. But with uh, when when you have this IP nonsense going in, and they they make their living by being patent trolls, then you have uh, you have a situation where they can say that they own an idea and earn their living by other people improving it. Right. But that's not going to happen, dude. Right. Well, what I what I see happening eventually is I, I think the system is going to get so absolutely clogged up and jammed up to where nobody's able to do anything new, and they're going to have to reexamine it and maybe make the leash a little bit longer. I mean, the, the, the collar will still be tight, but the leash will be longer. Well, you know, they're supposed to have – so long that you have the copyright and then it it's done and so what they're what people do is when the copyright is close to being expired they're buying it and renewing it and extending it so you got movies from the 30s and the 40s for instance that still have copyright on them imagine what would what could be done if somebody had the freedom to just take those movies and those movie clips and play with them Imagine what can be done with the music today. There's so much creativity that is that is crushed because of because IPs because you can't you can't just liberally take from other people's songs and art and movies and and whatever. Was, well, let's let's take a step further. You, you did that one uh, thing. I, yeah, I, I I love movies. I love music, and and those things are really nice. But let, let, let's take a step further. And what if you didn't have this IP on medications. What if somebody could come along, take a medication that's currently in existence, and maybe they know something that somebody else didn't know, and they take that medication and they make an improvement upon it to where it saves even more lives? Well, what if? That's a big what if. Yeah. Now, so, what they'll argue no. is, well, you know, we put a lot of money and research to develop these products and, you know, but especially, especially medicine. Medicine does cost a lot to develop and bring to market. One of the reasons, though, is because of the, of the, the FDA and what you have to pay to go through the FDA. So, they're, you know, they're putting millions and millions of dollars to invest in these medicines before they get it to market. So they're like, dude, if we didn't have the IP to protect us for this period of time, we wouldn't have the incentive because as soon as we developed it, somebody would be able but to when just... you But when you look at so many of these IP laws that raise the cost of bringing something to market because uh, 
an argument could be made that these that these uh, pharmaceutical companies have lobbied the FDA for these regulations to create a barrier to entry to new market actors. Yeah, and they do. So, it rises, and, so and, essentially, and, what they're doing is they're they're taking poison that they've built up a bit of an immunity to, and hoping to expose others that have no immunity to it and kill them with it. And the poison being the regulation with their the barriers song. to entry. Kill them softly with their song, you mean. Let's let's be civil here. So I think that's that's it for this segment. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go to a quick two minute break here. I'm gonna do a next round of promotions. And by the way, if you guys are watching this and you like this, make sure that you're sharing this. Do it. Uh because if you don't do it, why the heck aren't you? Are you a statist? Don't be a statist. Yes, share it. Leave comments. Yeah, leave we, comments. We, Try to bury that one nasty comment. I don't get yeah, nasty comments on our shows. <laughs> then I get yeah, little one. Maybe, maybe that was me. Maybe that was one of Danny's sock accounts. Ooh. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> some maybe someday we'll tell you guys the story of Danny. Danny is <laughs> Danny's a cool dude, but he's No, not really. Nah, he's cool. Come on, dude. He's he's cool. So when we come back. We're going to be we're going to be extending the leash for you guys a little bit. Uh, actually, I had planned on doing the FCC story first, but I'm going to change it because I have a feeling we're probably going to talk about this one <laughs> all on its own. Even though the title of the show is based on the FCC story, I'm I'm going to go. We're going to hit move to Somalia. Sure. Now that this that's off the leash. Happened. That's off the leash. We're going. We're going way out of order. Well, well, no, no. It, we are off the leash. Remember, we're going to be talking about your camping, so we're going to get it in. You wanted okay, this story right. covered, dude. You wanted this story covered, so it's in longer leash. Because you know what? It's not fully off the leash. It's it's really a long leash, though. We'll see you. We'll see you on the other side. I think. Hold on. Let me get this. There we go. It's all fear and loathing in Stady Bon State, Prince Land, but that does not need to be the case. What are the stories you're missing that might counter that fear and loathing? You'll find those stories and more at iState.tv, your home for news, views, podcasts, and more that exposes the reality of power and shares. Opportunities for tilting the balance of power towards individuals and free associations. Go to iState.tv now. Be sure to register on the site to get daily updates sent directly to your email. If you want to think outside the box, sometimes you have to wear outside the box. All of your outside the box threads can be found at agora.threadless.com. Go to agora.threadless.com and find the right outside-the-box threads to fit your outside-the-box head. That's agora.threadless.com. Go to the Agora unless, of course, you're scared. You are listening to iState.tv's iWire Pulse, your home for the edge of the pulse, where we expose the reality of power around you and the opportunity to change that reality to favor individuals and free associations. If you like this podcast, please be sure to go to pay.istate.tv and sign up to be a monthly iStater. And now, back to the show. You are listening to iWire Pulse Monday with Professor Rambo and Paul Gordon, featuring full auto, iWorld... <laughs> That's the wrong one. This isn't Monday. This is Thursday, Lou. I told you to fix that in post. So you're going to fix that in post, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get right on that. This is the story. Uh, we're, we're doing longer leash, and you're right. Technically, this is off the leash, but, 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 but not quite. We're going to do the Somalia story here, and this is our little, uh, this is our longer leash bump. How are coercive associations lengthening the leash on their pets? We cover stories of the state, the government, the coercive enterprise, the coercive association, plotting to or succeeding in lengthening the leash on those they presume to rule. And this is this is a good this is a good story here. This is you guys have heard 
anybody who who likes any if if you're even if you're a minarchist you've probably heard this sometimes okay if you're in the reduced government to the smallest measure possible all the way Somalia! to <laughs> Somalia this story's probably going to tick them off really do you have the story up or do you have notes on this you want me to no i no, I don't, but let, let's do a little background on this. Okay, so, let's do it. Let's do the background. So the the argument, and, and, and I was when I was new to libertarianism, uh, probably around uh, maybe 2011, something like that, somewhere in that time range, 2010, 2011, I was brand new to libertarianism, and because I was new to libertarianism, I was ignorant of uh, economic – of uh, libertarian lessons, principles, and philosophy. And I was still kind of thinking in the statist mindset. And somebody had said, well, if, if, if you don't like government so much, why don't you move to Somalia? And they showed this video, and it was a video of uh, really horrible stuff that was happening there and and really just a, a – you know, not a really good place to be in. And I started getting worried for me. I says, Wow. What if these what if these commie progressives are right? And because <laughs> by commie progressives I mean both liberals or both uh, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, because they are they're all commie progressives. So, so you're an equal the, opportunity offender. Well, well, here's the thing: I was questioning libertarianism, but I wasn't questioning libertarianism because I didn't believe that was a good idea. I was questioning libertarian because I didn't know why it was a good idea. So, what you have to ask is: with, with Somalia, uh, the the notion that they're providing is, in, in, by by this time, the government had collapsed and it it was stateless for the most part. Um, what you have to ask is: well, what really happened here? And is this a matter of one day everything's going fine and and um, you have schools, roads, airports, uh, public transportation, hospitals, and everything else? They, they have a good uh, social safety net and all this other stuff. You know, everything's fine, and then you just wake up one morning and and, and boom, gone. The government it, it is gone. It is shut down and <laughs> and right and. And before you can have your morning coffee, the warlords are out in the street and they're they're doing this and 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 yep. you, you have no well actually the warlords I don't even aren't. think you can have coffee at that point. The, your the, your coffee's the, probably magically gone too because without yeah. government. Well, the warlords are not out in the streets. The warlords are out in the dirt where the street used to be because this somebody came through the some roads. government employee that came out. They came out, they rolled up the roads, put them on the back of a truck, and took them off to some warehouse somewhere. And <laughs> I could see it. Know, I could see them yeah. driving in their road collecting truck. And if you don't yeah. like us, we're taking our roads. We're going to take our roads and go home. We're taking our roads. You, you can keep our balls. We're taking our roads. So, <laughs> well, they don't so, have balls. So that's the truck. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, so. Is this just a matter of you woke up one morning, government was gone, and, and so were the roads and the hospitals and everything else? Or is there something else to it? Uh, what was the condition in Somalia before the government collapsed? I mean, because I, it, it would be a fair guess that not everything was going perfectly at the time of collapse. Uh, maybe things were bad, and that's why that's why the government did collapse was because things were not going well. Well, it turns out that um, it wasn't that Somalia had everything going great, and and everybody was singing "Kumbaya" or whatever traditional songs they sing there. I don't know "Hakuna Matata" or something. Like that. I don't Hakuna know. Hakuna Matata. Uh, yeah, Sorry, or, or, or maybe or, or maybe ninety nine bottles of beer on the wall. Whatever. <laughs> But it, it, it turns out that the the government collapsed there because it was a failed socialist state. That's right. It was a failed socialist state, and the people that are complaining about the results of a failed socialist state are the ones that want to create a allegedly successful socialist state in their homelands. Uh, in, in this case, they're Americans. But what they don't realize is that socialism cannot be uh, successful, and socialism is always going to fail. The only question is what the timeline is. So, right. Somalia, well, and the timeline is, is affected the of, yeah. by how much well, you can loot from the outside and bring in. Yeah. 
the less you can loot from the outside and bring in, the faster it collapses. Yeah. So they're they're complaining that Somalia turned into what that Somalia turned into the inevitable outcome of their master plan. And they're complaining because it collapsed. Now, ultimately, what was what was the condition of Somalia prior to the collapse? Uh, Somalia, like most African countries, was was never really industrialized. It was it was never it was never a big economic power. You you know, it's it's uh, were the neighboring countries. I think Ethiopia is one of them, and they're absolutely dirt poor. Correct, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is. I don't know if they're dirt poor, but they're yeah, they're not yeah, they're rich. dirt poor. Yeah, and they're the neighbors. Is is Kenya in there also, or is is that somewhere else? I'm I'm not good with with uh, uh, African geography. I can check. I okay, can do you that. do you do that. that. Well, I check. You do what you do. Okay, yeah. Somalia, check, Kenya's to the south, Ethiopia's to the northwest. Okay, so. What we have is 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 countries that uh, and they're all pretty poor. There, there's no real economy going there. It's it's a lot of uh, nomadic and farming and, and stuff like that. But I, you you don't have BMW plants there. You don't have the Ford plant. You don't have. There's a lot of stuff that you don't have there. You don't have much of anything in in many regards. So it it really wouldn't it really wouldn't advance uh too much on its own especially with the government because in africa you have a you've had a lot of socialism throughout the throughout the the 20th I mean, century like, in africa i'm good no more no more socialism I'm good. yeah like yeah. that level Be- yeah, because because if you look at the resources that you have there and and the soviet union is an example of this uh there's plenty of resources in the old in the former Soviet Union. Uh, Siberia is is very rich with resources: the oil, gold, I just all these different minerals, the, the lumber, I know all this stuff. Uh, the the problem that the Soviets have is Siberia is a horribly inhospitable climate. Uh, I the the territory it's, is just it's not good. Yeah, so I, their summers I mean, are three days. So yeah, yeah, the, they hope the summer falls on a weekend each year. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. it. Right. Oh, it's but, Wednesday. But, Dang it! Summer fell yeah. on a Wednesday. Yeah, but in comparison, you don't you don't have those harsh winters in, in these African countries. And if you look at why they haven't advanced with all these resources that they that they do have available to them, you now a lot of it has been the the socialism that their governments have have put them under. Yeah, but it's not just that. It's something else. It's an, I guess you well, could well, say it's another form of socialism. It's the IMF. Yes. So the well, IMF the, comes in there and they give their country a loan with really, really bad rates and deals. They give the country the loan. Payday lenders. Yeah, payday lenders. That's that level, yeah. So they give the country the loan and the money that is lent actually stays with the the, the goons on top. They don't actually filter it down and do anything with it. And then the loans come due and they are missing payments and they're late. And then there's deals that are made or basically the IMF is like, well, you know, we'll just take this land over here that has all these resources. And uh, so uh, Africa is every bit a victim of, of the world bank, the IMF as it is its internal socialism. And IMF to me is form of, Socialism. external external socialism and, yeah. and there's another one here i'm just pulling up the article and this is on uh i found this at uh scott scott horton.org i heard him scott talking horton. about this on the tom wood show recently and it says uh the title of it is u.s government to blame for somali's misery and there's the preview that he gave i haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet but the preview that he gave and, and i think the I think the really large article may be on Future or Freedom Foundation, possibly. I can't remember. That's just but... fee for you people. Yeah. No, no, this is FFF. Oh, no, it's not fee. Never mind. Fee is freedom, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, Foundation for Economic Education. Yeah, that's it. That's uh, it. totally So I, I'll, I'll try and find it before the end of the show. Uh, I, I make no guarantees on that. But anyway, uh, what what he does is, in, in that really long article, he highlights how the U.S. intervention in Somalia, uh, particularly from possibly leading into the collapse, but definitely after the collapse. Because uh, if, if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, 
the 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 same guy that that those rangers were going after to to uh capture and bring in they had to provide security for him not too long later at uh at peace talks with other warlords you're crinkling so, by the way you're making a crinkling sound okay is it done am i please stop twirling your beard <laughs> it wasn't the beard it was something else i know anyway but anyway so what so with the with the interventions going on there and backing all these different warlords uh without the, without the financial backing the warlords aren't going to they're, they're not going to be able to fight it's 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 just how can i put it um if wars were privately fought by corporations that they're fought on behalf of by governments, if they They'd run if, out of money if, real fast, yeah, yeah. If Standard Oil had to, had to fund the overthrow of, of uh, the Guatemalan government on their own, it never would have happened. They would run when, out of money real fast. Yeah, they, yeah. But, yeah. But when you can socialize the, the the cost of this and privatize the profits, then yeah, I mean, just, why not? And yeah, you, the you warlords get, are getting. For whatever you know, the, all these different countries see an opportunity to get some sort of uh, foothold on Somalia, which has geographical strategic uh, significance. In addition to all that, in addition, oh, we, our live video was interrupted for a bit, but it'll it should be back here in a moment. Is and that what that dinging was? Yeah, that was my OBS was punching me in the face. It said, "Okay, OBS right. is disconnected," but it's back now. So All right, for a minute, I was thinking that uh, that I was getting notifications for for something stupid on my computer because it makes a noise. I thought that I I thought that I uh, got rid of uh, the sounds on those things, but well, this is a sound that I kind of want to hear if it happens. It's kind of important. It kind okay, of matters. Well, yeah. So. In addition to all this, you're only telling part of the story because every time people say Somalia, that's all they think about. And what you're describing, though, is not Somalia. It's southern Somalia. Well, well, let's take a step further. Uh, ben Powell, and he's with the Independent Institute, he's done quite a bit of uh, research on um the big things that he talks about that really shock the living daylights out of people are how sweatshops actually benefit the people that work there rather than exploit and, and torture them. Um, he also yeah, you don't, talks you about don't, uh, well, yeah, I, I know, I know that argument. It's, you know, you're these, these, these do gooder Westerners are like, you're child labor and you can't do that. And you know, you don't realize that that economy is at a stage in their development where, the choice for their children at that moment in time is to work or die. Not just mm -hmm. them, but their whole family. So what happens is a generation, their children work, they make a certain amount of money. They're able to save a little. They're able to invest in their own lives and improve their lives to a certain degree. The economy starts to improve. There are more skilled people that can do more you know, develop more products and services. And then the next generation, it's not the children that's working anymore. It's just like, you know, the great myth, the the, the Gilded Age and how mm -hmm. the progressive age comes along and rescues us from the Gilded Age, from the robber barons. Children working was on its way out because if parents had their druthers, they don't want their kids working. They want their kids to have the best lives possible. But when you're when you're desperate for food, everybody works, mm -hmm. and, Paul, and that's how it's been throughout most of history. Children work. But Paul, most of don't you, don't you know that eight eight year olds are better at putting engines into into brand new vehicles at the factory than full grown, <laughs> uh, mature, physically fit male adults, and they cost less. And because they cost less, that's why they that's why they hire kids to do this. So right. yeah, it, it, it's that's, really nonsense, but. It's, but but, he's get, being but getting back, yeah. But but getting, I'm I'm here. You don't have to talk about me in the third person. But uh, he do, he does Somalia need here. to be talked about in the third person. Go ahead. Getting back to Somalia after the central government collapsed, and you had you no longer had this mismanagement of the economy. Well, you didn't have management of the economy to begin with. What you saw were. Uh, you, Telecom companies popping up, and, and they weren't putting up landlines. They weren't they weren't going and doing that. They skipped straight into cellular, and at this time, the the three G was the big thing. So they had three G service going, and they had 
In in this third world country, they had first world cellular service, communication capability. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Africa is probably has a better network, uh, especially mesh wise. They have a better mm-hmm. network than we do here. Yeah. So now put that in your pipe there, and smoke it. Th- there there was a group that that went and they looked at the metrics that they measure to figure out how successful people are in a particular area. And there's certain things that they look at, like uh, child mortality rates, access to clean water, access to medicine, health care, lifespan, murder rate, and all this sort of stuff. And what they found was that post-government Somalia had improved on probably every single metric, if not every metric, nearly every metric. So you had improvements in, 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 in uh, life expectancy, you had more access to clean water and medicine under statelessness than you had under a central government. Now I'm going to get and, to the story because we're well, almost on, done with this hang, segment. Well, <laughs> but, our but segment we got, has basically but, been the history of Somalia. It's but, quite but a build-up. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's the more. Murder, the murder rate in Somalia was lower than the murder rate in Detroit. Anti. anti That's not a uh, surprise. State, State with Somalia had a lower murder rate than. So, so what you're, so what you're saying is people shouldn't say if you don't like it, move to Somalia. They should say move to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you like, if you like failed socialist states, move to Detroit. There you go. That's that's the, where the, m- many of yeah, you need to move. Yeah, we'll call it the failed state project. So, so the northern Somalia, by the way, has a better Somali standard. Land, yeah. Somaliland is what it's called. They have a a better, uh, they have better everything, <laughs> and they have, uh, they have a system. Let me try and find it here. Zier, zier. They use it. Yeah, zier law. Zier, zier law. It, it's not really law though. It's it's kind of like common law, but it's basically if you did something to violate someone's property, there's no punishment. There's recompense. You have to make do. And and it's a very clannish community. So the accountability among one another is pretty freaking high. You And really, if you think about it, with that level of accountability, everybody knows everybody. And if they don't know you, they know your clan. And if they, if they know your clan, they're going to know you pretty quick. And your clan mm-hmm. doesn't want to be saddled with your crap. It has an interest in settling things with other clans. Collectivist so the cost, peer pressure. Peer pressure, right. So it's the cost of coercion is rather high in Somaliland. If you go to Somaliland and you try to rip somebody off, you're, you're going to be in, in, in for it. So they, they, I, 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 I kind of think they're kind of playing the Rahava game. Rahava is an experiment that's going on in Syria. If you go to iState.tv and search for Rahava, we co- we try to cover it regularly. Uh, they use status type of terminology, and they kind of use the status language. And I think in part they use it because if they don't, if people look at what they're doing and think, wait, these are like actual anti-staters, well, <laughs> I don't think they're going to cotton to that. So I think they kind of play a game here. But they've... They've been around since, where's the date here? Uh, when were they founded here? You see it here, 19, some, maybe 19, 1991. Uh, May 1991, they were formed right after uh, southern Sudan collapsed. I mean, southern Somalia collapsed. The government collapsed. And so Somaliland took the opportunity to say, dude, we've been wanting to get away from these people for a while. So they declared themselves Somaliland. They haven't had any recognition. And now they're finally getting recognition. And it's perfect where they're getting the recognition from because the recognition is coming from DP World, which is a harbor, a port management company. And they made a deal with them to build an enterprise-free zone in the same kind of tradition as Dubai, like what Dubai had with their, it's called the, uh, the, the Jebel Ali free zone. This one's going to be called the Barbera free zone. So what's going on in Somaliland? You have a, a system. They have they have 
They don't have status-type institutions like we have. They don't have laws that try to preemptively stop you from committing crimes. They punish. They don't even punish you. You just have to make good. If you if you if you kill, if you hurt, if if you steal, whatever, a price has to be paid, <laughs> and it has to be paid by you and or your clan. So it's kind of like uh, I don't know if I want to call it complete statelessness, but it's it's real it's real close there. So kind of ironically, if they say if you don't like it here, move to Somalia. Well, you, you're going to want to say more yes. Viable. It's, it's becoming, becoming more, more viable. viable. Yeah, <laughs> it's becoming more viable. You're going to want to you're going to move to that free enterprise zone, that Berbera free zone. Go ahead, set up shop there, and and there you go. So yeah. we we spent most of this segment talking about the history of some well, the recent history of Somalia before we got to the actual story. But I think it was worth it. We're 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 not going to take the last break here because we're we're almost we got like 10 minutes left so we're not going to take our second break instead we're just going to transition oh i realize i just have my my thing on you the whole time it's been showing just you for about 10 <laughs> minutes even we even while i've been talking i got to get the hang of of changing these scenes it's hard to do it while you're doing the show so i'm going to play the i got to play the intro though i got to play the intro for our last segment are you ready for the last segment I I'm ready. Bring it. Best segment. How are others enjoying lives that exist beyond the reach of the leash of the state, the government, the course of enterprise, the course of association? How, in other words, are people living off the leash and how much you join them? And now we're off the leash. And you can't see it. I don't know if you can. If you can see it, if you can see the background. Yeah, yeah, I'm not watching the video. I'm oh, not watching okay. the video right now. You can't see it, but the the background is some mountains. Got the the forest behind us, and it's kind of fitting, you know, being off the leash and what we're going to actually talk about. What we're going to talk about is how do you live off the leash, Lou? I can I can see it now. I just brought up the I just brought up the page to take see, a look see, at it. If and uh, when you get a green screen. Well, one, the, you could be in the I, mountains to talk with about me. camping here camping. and i i don't know that it's necessarily living off the leash but it's it's certainly it, it, uh, no, it's, it's not, certainly but it's, liberating but it's 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 having a little slice of off the leash right? yeah 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 cuz I mean, what what i'll do is um i grant I, I have a nice little camper you've seen it uh, you you've I've said it in. we've done an interview yeah yeah i've done a show I, with you in your camper Yes, you have seen the oven that I don't use to cook bacon in. This is taking a dark turn, <laughs> real fast. <laughs> real real fast. fast. Well, you guys saw the title of the show. It's frying bacon in Saskatchewan. So yeah, so he's a bacon fryer, ladies and gentlemen. I just break it so, to you. This is just like that. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll be set up in a campground that has electricity, and that is my preference. Because uh, I, I I like to be able to run my equipment and everything and and uh, not gobble up all my propane and battery power, but every once in a while I will go out somewhere and go to like a rustic campground or go to a place that doesn't even have a actual campground. And I'm thinking of two whoa, places right whoa, now. Whoa, 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 whoa! You go and set up. In a non campground, you set up a camp in a non camp, dude. People, do people still do that? Yes, I do, wow. and a handful of others do. So I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of two places right now. Uh, one, one of the rustic places. Uh, it's an actual campground, and it, it, it's really neat. It, there's a there's a chain of lakes there, so it's it's really good for the for the pack or paddle crowd. Um, so if if you want to do the backpacking and go through the chain of lakes, because wait wait pretty... hold on, you're burying the leap. Could you please explain that packer paddle crowd? Yeah, packer paddle. Uh, packer paddle would be backpacking and going out into a remote area and camping, uh, or paddling would be taking a canoe or kayak and your gear and going out to those areas to uh, to do your little camping and and getting away from it all. 
And it's, it's really nice because there's no cell phone reception out there, no Facebook, no Twittering at each other, uh, barely a text message in, in some of the places. But uh, the I, uh, I the, don't know if I could the, take that. Oh, trust me, you'll you'll get used to it. So the the chain of lakes, I I've been out there a few times before, but I never really checked it out too much. I'd walked out a little bit and, and seen like the the second lake, but I'd never paddled it and never really checked out the whole territory out there. And this past year, I I got out there a couple times, and one of those times I did go out there and I did check everything out. I I took the canoe or I'm sorry, the kayak this time and I went out to all these different locations and got a chance to hang out and, and you know, check out the wilderness and watch critters. I, not a lot of critters, mostly birds and squirrels and stuff like that, but uh, now I, I got a chance to be out there and away from all the nonsense. Now, what's really nice about having the camper and being in like a rustic site? Oh, by the way, going back to the uh, going back to the chain of lakes, there's a a number of campsites back in along these different uh, along these different lakes out there, and you can't drive back there, so that's why it's called pack or paddle. So you have to take your canoe and go out to these different campsites out on this lake. And, and they got some stuff that, that's out there a little ways. And we're not talking uh, uh, several hours to hike back to. It's not super distance, but um, and if you're carrying all your gear, it's a nice hike. Or if you're paddling with it, it'll still take you a while but to you, get across the I'm lakes. Assuming you you got to know what you're go, doing to, to, to a certain degree to go out there. A little bit. It, 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 it's kind of like a practice one because out there they do have a porta potty. They do have, uh, uh, was it a, well, the vault toilet. Then they got a water pump out there too. So you don't have to worry about taking all your stuff out there. And it's probably not too difficult to get help in the, in the event of an emergency. It's, it's not a super long hike to get back to civilization. The trails are, are pretty clearly marked. And it's not even rough terrain to get back. So it's, it's deep woods camping, but kind of like, kind of like with training wheels on it, training paddles. Okay, I, I, I think I could do it. And you know, I think you're right. I think if I got out there after like probably the first two or three hours of of twitching, I would be like, even if I didn't have my phone with me, I'd be like, every five seconds, reaching for my phone. I did I get a like? What's the Bitcoin price after about? You would be. You would be after about three hours. At- you would be surprised at how easy it is to adapt, and the only thing that you'll take your phone out for is taking pictures. That's, you know what, that's a beautiful thought. And on that thought, I think we're going to wrap up the show. We're just about done here. We're going to we're going to try to keep our shows to an hour. Sometimes they're going to go longer, and every once in a while, something will happen. We might go really longer than an hour. Marathon, but generally speaking. Marathon, right? We we could have talked all the whole thing about Somalia. That could have taken oh, a whole freaking show, man. We, we could talk the whole time about camping. Yeah. Oh, and, and I, I want to mention, uh, you are you're you're in the planning stages still, but you are working on a solo show, right? Where you'll be doing interviews, and but it's going to be called the Lou Sanders Show, right? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff on there. Uh, I'm going to be I, I on that a, show. Yes, I have a I have a bunch of interviews I did at the fifth annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, and by the way, the sixth annual there. Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest will be coming up this June, and I look forward to seeing you at number six. Also, I'm planning bring, on it. Yeah, bring your daughter back. Bring you. you I, can I hope bring to bring Bodie my back. wife with me this time as well. Yeah, she couldn't bring last your wife. Time. You can even bring Bodie again. I would happily bring Bo- well actually if I bring Bodie I'll have to bring bring his uh bring his Mrs. Bodie significant other Mrs. Bodie well, I'll have to bring we'll Mrs. Bring, Bodie. We'll bring her too. Oh yeah, I happy to bring Mrs. Bodie. She's awesome. Yeah, I've never met her, so I don't know. I, I haven't anyway. met her in person, but I've known her well on on the Facebooks. I knew her on the Facebooks before she was Mrs. Bodie. So yeah. There's that. So but, anyway, yeah, the, the, the Bodie the and I come- we stayed at the Rainbow cabin that was, <laughs> that was nice. the pride cabin the pride cabin pride. But I, by the way there's i'm going to be posting the epi, the interviews from the midwest peace and liberty fest last year and also i'm going to be doing uh a lot of other interviews and 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 talk about solutions um 
yeah. is really going to is going to be the opposite of the occupy movement. It's going to be the vacate movement because I if like you that. have a situ- if you have a situation that you can't fix, vacate it. Don't occupy it. Don't waste any more effort trying to revive that dead beast. I like it. I like it. And and that's a, and you know the theme of this show to a certain degree. Yeah, pay attention. Figure out. I, I'm I'm most. I'm a strong believer in understanding the reality of power around you. So, yeah, you want to, to a certain degree, what are these people up to? What's going on? But, like, the opening of our show, I, I love that quote in uh, Dune. Fear is the mind killer. They hit you with fear porn every day, and they paralyze yep. you with fear. And And to a certain degree, I'm not saying fear is not a bad thing. Sometimes fear is a good thing. I don't I don't think you should cut fear out of your life. But but they want you to live in fear. They want you to be paralyzed. So this show yeah, we're going to highlight some things that maybe you should be paying attention to, but all of our all of our shows Monday through Thursday, our last segments specifically are all about uh hope. There's, there's a lot of great stuff going on out there that's there's reason to be optimistic, I'll say, that the the tide of history is strongly against the course of enterprise as you know it. The advantages that his has had over centuries are fast coming to an end. And something's rising, and it's not another course of enterprise. And that's the, what we're only- trying to talk about. And the thing that's going to be necessary to uh, obtain freedom, I'm not talking about this fake freedom, faux freedom. I'm talking about pure, un, pure, uncut liberty. What's going to be necessary for that to happen is going to be to abandon fear and vacate the state. Those that talk about how they live in the fr- freest country remind me of dogs that brag about having the longest leash. Right. Get that's off. That's why – yeah. Get off the leash. Yeah, that's why the shows, as I design them for the different co-hosts, I tried to fit. And for you, leashes, dude. <laughs> it's, it's shorter. You, you. I mean, you. Could, some people want the shorter leash, and they some revel the in the longer chain. leash. They, they most they revel in that long. The thing is, if you think you live in the freest country, maybe you do. But if you do, it's because your preferences are allowed greater leeway in the country that you're in. But I can guarantee you that there are people that have different preferences than you that would be freer in China than in America. Yeah, I said that. Yeah. Or maybe the reason that you believe that you live in the freest country is because you know nothing about other countries. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's – I I would have – that would have to be it because I know – just even the last couple of years, and I'm one that actually I'm not totally unfamiliar with other countries. I haven't been to other countries, but you know, I read and I look at videos. You know, you, I look at YouTube videos, so I know things. But now on YouTube, there are so many people that are are doing really uh, daily journaling in a, in a many different countries, and you learn, wow, it's an eye opener when you see them. They go to their grocery store and they see what they're seeing and uh and you learn like practically the things that they have to deal with and then you see that they could do certain things you're like whoa i can't do that here you can do that there i can't do that here so if you think you're in the freest country you might not be uh it really depends on what it is you want to do with your life on that end i think we're going to wrap up here we're going to not be back next thursday because i will be watching my daughter perform a bunch of things in one night but we will be back next thursday night and i don't know it's possible that you're gonna see lou he uh one of the other nights as a third for one of those nights if you if you can do it if not we'll see you two two thursdays from now two thursday nights from now and with that do you have any any last things to say to our studio audience before we punch yeah. this puppy in the head make it happen Th- Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure being had. And get off the plantation. Get on the blockchain. Get on the blockchain right now. All right. But we'll get see off you the guys. plantation. Yeah. And actually, don't get on the get on the blockchain now. But get 
get prepared to get on the quantum computing chain because that's coming right behind the blockchain. Bye, everybody. <laughs>